Okay, so we're back in Wanda, and uh, what, was our, what was wrong with Salsa? Uh, <coughs> remember that on a retreat like this, it is often more important that you have a good time, that you enjoy yourself. But it is not about how many hours that you do in it. Yeah? It's, if each meditation is more enjoyable, it's more important than the number of hours that you do in it. So find that nice balance in the, in, on the retreat then. And as you do so, you uh, become much more enjoyable, more sustainable, uh, more beneficial, uh, and everything tends to come together as a result. Uh. So, uh, let us come back to the gradual training. And yesterday we were having a look at uh, the beginning of right action, which is starts off with uh, the idea of not killing living beings. Uh, and one of the important points about morality or ethics in Buddhism is the idea that it has just two sides to it. In English, morality, or in most European languages, the idea of morality is, you know, you don't do bad things. But in Buddhism, the idea of Sima is much more complete than that. It's about your entire character development. It's about doing what is right and <coughs> avoiding what is bad. So it is a much more complete course in training, if you like it. And this is true for all of the aspects of morality on the Buddhist path. Each one of these ones has a positive side and a negative side. And both aspects should really be developed if you want to uh, take the path, you know, to take it as far as possible. Uh, so please uh, keep that in mind. And, uh, and the other thing, which is a, a very interesting thing about the way the Buddhist sutras are phrased and the way they are structured, uh, is that there's always a sequence to things. There's always a purpose to every kind of sequence. Uh, yeah, you talk as you hear about the five khandhas, uh, yeah, you know, the, the five aspects of personality, yeah, the five hindrances, the uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, the groups of whatever it is. And the sequence is always significant. Yeah, it's not random, it's not kind of five hindrances, it's like kind of a random conglomeration of factors. The eightfold path is just a random sequence. The sequence is meaningful. Uh, and this is certainly very clear with the Eightfold Path because it is specifically mentioned in the suttas that the Eightfold Path, you know, one thing leads to the next one. Yeah, there's a, there's a natural sequence there. Now, with things like the five hindrances and the five khandhas, the five factors of personality, the five aggregates, as it's sometimes called, it, it is not so obvious, but there too, there is a sequence. And that sequence is found strictly the same throughout the suttas. Always one thing first, uh, then the second thing, and the third thing. These things are always meaningful. Yeah, these are not, never random. And the same thing here when we look at morality. Uh, the most significant aspect of morality in this case comes first. So killing living beings comes first. Then we have stealing, the second one. Then we have sexual misconduct as the third one. Yeah, with speech, it's the same thing. You start off with lying. Lying is the worst kind of speech. Then you have divisive speech. Then you have harsh speech. Then you have idle chapter, yeah, which is the kind of the least bad one. Which is good, isn't it? So we can, idle chapter, we can do everything. It's not the, not the worst one, which is handy for some people. <laughs> yeah. Handy for everyone, probably, actually. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so that is, remember that sequence in it. Uh, uh, and that's important because it shows you where, what is to be prioritized. Uh, the uh, the uh, idea of purifying the mind, as I mentioned yesterday, is gradual. Uh, you have to start with those things that are the most significant and then you move on to more refined aspects later on. Uh. So that is, so yesterday we had a look at not killing living beings. Yeah, It includes all living beings. Uh, the exact boundaries is also an interesting question. What does it mean? For example, when we come very low on the scale, at what point is something not a living being anymore? Is a virus, is that a living being? Yeah. And uh, it's hard to know. I, I would say probably not. Yeah, it's probably not. Oops, cut out already. Okay, <laughs> so much for that. <laughs> is, that uh, is that the end of that one? It's flashing, flashing like mad over here. Yeah. I think the battery might be dead already. <laughs> Okay, back again. Okay, okay, something happened. Geez, uh, technology is not, not all reliable, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, um, uh, where exactly are the cutoff points for living beings? Is a question that sometimes arises. Uh, and usually, the way it is defined in the Vinaya, in the suttas, is that the uh, 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 
I think they call it in the vision anything that is visible, yeah, that you can see moved is visible as a living being, yeah, that would count as a living being. Yeah. If it is invisible, then it. Uh, and the reason for that is not necessarily that that is the exact cut-off point, but it may simply have been a practical consideration at the time of the Buddha. They didn't really know about microscopic things in those days. They had no microscopes, so they were, you know they couldn't. There's nothing they could do about that. Uh, so. But, um, so it's hard to know, but generally speaking, I would not regard bacteria and viruses as living beings in any ordinary sense. Uh, do they have, does a bacteria have consciousness? Well, it's just unknown, we just don't know about that. Uh, and in the meantime, because of, uh, uh, you know, for, just for practical reasons, I think it is best to regard bacteria as unproblematic to kill bacteria, otherwise we get into some serious problems as well. So actually we have more any evidence for the consciousness of bacteria, <laughs> uh, we, I think we can assume that they don't have, have any consciousness. I think that is an acceptable, uh, uh, acceptable assumption. Anyway, whoops, what, what am I doing here? I think there must be some bad connection or something here. Okay. No. Is it a bacteria? Is it something else? <coughs> something is flashing here. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Just changed, didn't you? Okay, yeah. So there should be fresh ones, yeah. Maybe it's a loose connection or something. Yeah. Okay, should I use this one? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Okay, is this one? Oh, this one is working. Okay. 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 So, uh, there's always technological problems. Yeah, technology is supposed to make life easier. Sometimes it makes life complicated. Yeah. Anyway. So, come to the second factor of uh, right effort, or not right effort, right action rather, yeah. and this is the not stealing, so the abandoning, the taking of what is not given, the, the abstains from taking what is not given, taking only what is given, expecting only what is given by not stealing, they abide in purity. Yeah. So this is about uh, stealing and taking what is not given. I'm not sure why we translate in that way. It's obviously about stealing. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of become the standard. Yeah. Uh, and again, I remember the things I was mentioning yesterday about the uh, degrees, the variations. Yeah, there is stealing which is really bad, and there is stealing which is less bad. It depends on your motivations, where you're coming from, why you're doing these things. Yeah. And it's important to remember that because we tend to f think that you either steal is bad or you don't steal is good, but it's not quite like that. Uh, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, if a person who is in desperate circumstances trying to help someone who is in a desperate way, for example, uh, it is far less bad than if you steal simply because you, you know, you uh, uh, for, for purely greedy reasons or whatever. So it really it depends a little bit. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, the first point, as always. And in this case, too, there is a positive side to uh, uh, the absence from stealing. And the positive side, in this case, is generosity. Yeah, generosity is the exact opposite of stealing. In one case, you are greedy, acquiring, acquiring things for yourself. But in the other case, you're open-handed, uh, giving out, having this open heart, which gives out to, you know, willing to share with the world around you. Uh, and uh, the reason why generosity is not mentioned here, I think, is because it is such an important factor on the Buddhist path uh, that it actually is talked about separately in a large number of cases. Uh, generosity is one of the foundations of Buddhist practice. Yeah, well, the Buddha sometimes gives the what he calls the uh, uh, a grad graduated teaching. Yeah? It always starts off with generosity, then it moves on to morality, then it goes on to renun renunciation. In other words, giving up the uh, sensuality for a deeper meditation, etc. Uh, but it starts off with generosity. That's how important it is. Uh, if you want to have access to real, profound meditation, if you want to enter samadhi, the only way you're going to have, be able to enter samadhi is if you have a generous heart. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that state of mind, which goes into deep meditation, is a generous state of mind, where you are willing to share, you're willing to kind of, you open up to the world around you. Right? Yeah, if you want to attain a deep insight, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah? That you have to purify generosity, per perfect it before you can actually enter deep meditation. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mental state in this case, it's not actually something you do, but, but the mental state obviously reflects also how you act outwardly. Yeah? And this is one of the ways that you can decide whether someone is a, uh, you know, uh, what is one of the characteristics of someone who has entered the stream, the sort of other. And one of the characteristics of a stream entry is that they are endlessly giving. Yeah, yeah they have really kind of opened up to the world. The, the life really is about giving to others, about sharing, and uh, whatever it is, the Dhamma, or even the material goods, whatever they have. Uh, this is kind of one of the characteristics of stream entry. Yeah. So uh, this is kind of useful to, to remember. It kind of gives you a little bit of idea how to how to see these things. So. And it's fascinating, you know, that uh, the Buddha talks about generosity in a wide a number of ways, in a, in, a, in a large number of ways. And um, uh, I'm not going to look too much at those suttas now because it's going to take us too far afield, but uh, there are lots of beautiful little things in the suttas about uh, uh, what the Buddha says. One of the places, what he says, he says to the monks and the nuns, he says that if you knew the power of generosity, the way I know the power of generosity, you would never have a single meal without sharing with someone. Yeah, especially if you have something special or something different from someone else. Uh, always you would share whatever, whatever you have the opportunity. Yeah. Why? Because it's so powerful. That, yeah, it is such a beautiful thing to do. Yeah. And I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, sometimes you feel really generous. You really, you really want to share with other people. It's like your heart opens up to other people that, and you want to share. It's a beautiful feeling. You know instinctively that this is something high and lofty and, and wonderful about that. <laughs> and, and you can tell straight away that this is part of the spiritual path because it just feels good. Yeah, and, and what does what does a stinginess feel like? If you are stingy, it's like you feel contracted. You feel kind of I'm looking after myself. You're blocking yourself inside of yourself. Your world becomes small and tiny and kind of you know slightly oppressive. And yeah, that's what stinginess feels like. Yeah. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because we all have this feeling sometimes. Yeah, uh, but from that you can understand why generosity is so important. It opens up your mind. It encompasses the world. Uh, it's a bit like meta. Meta is you know the meta to the whole world. Uh, generosity has a similar kind of sense to it when you open up to everything. It's a very beautiful feeling in its own right. Uh, so for this reason, generosity is at the foundation of the Buddhist path. Uh, so please be generous whenever you have a chance. Uh, there's many ways of being generous. Uh, yeah, sometimes just looking after people. Uh, you know, you can do it in the workplace, in your family, with your fellows in the Buddhist life, whoever it is, you can always be kind to people. Kindness is really uh, just one. Uh, generosity and kindness obviously very closely related to each other. Yeah. So remember that. You know, one of the nice little things that shows you how easy it is to be generous is when the Buddha says, he says that, uh, uh, you know, even if you just, after you have washed the dishes in your house, or you washed out your bowl as a monastic or whatever, uh, the little food scraps that are left after washing the dishes, uh, if you take those food scraps uh, and you throw it out into your, into your garden or into the forest or wherever it is, uh, and you say, may those beings that feed on these little things, uh, may they support themselves by these little food scraps. Uh, I do that often. If I go back to my cutie, I have a meal, there's always a few rice grains left over. You can never eat every single rice grain. Yeah, so there's always a few left over. So I often, when I go back afterwards, I wash my bowl uh, and I throw it out. And I think, hey, those little insects, yeah, I live, I live in the forest already. Maybe the little insects, may they kind of enjoy this, may they feed on this. Or if there's something more left over, I kind of throw it out to the kangaroos, yeah, or to some other animal. Uh, and you can see the kangaroos, they get a piece of chocolate cake. It's not like they have an extra chocolate cake in your bowl. Kangaroos are so happy, yeah? They come, their eyes are light up, become really bright. Wow, chocolate cake. Usually all they eat is grass. You can imagine if you eat grass and you get chocolate cake, yeah, it's pretty exciting, right? Uh, <laughs> so that this is, and it's actually very nice when you see that. that you, uh, I'm not sure how good it is for those kangaroos, but uh, <laughs> anyway, if you get it once, you know, once a year, it's probably okay. Yeah. So uh, and this is how easy it is to, 
uh, mer merit, if you like, or to be generous. All you have to do is sometimes is just to turn your mind in the right direction. I could throw out those rice grains without any thought of it at all. Just chuck it out, and then you have made no merit at all. You have made no good karma. Or just turning your mind in the right direction. May this be for those little beings that already you're actually being generous and you're doing something positive. Right? So it's quite easy, yeah. And uh, I will point out when we come to right speech later on, uh, if you think about speech in the right way, you can think of speech as an act of generosity as well. Uh, every time you open your mouth, you have an opportunity to be generous to other people, say something kind, say something which they like to hear in the way that they enjoy. Yeah? So that the speech can be turned into an act of kindness and generosity. Uh, Every time you open your mouth, you have a chance to give someone a gift, a gift of a beautiful speech. And in this way, you make speech into a more <coughs> powerful factor of the path to support the practice for yourself and others. So this is the taking of what is not given and the generosity aspect of it. Uh, and uh, it says here, expecting only what is given. It's uh, a little bit strange that I, I can never, never make 100% sense out of that, but exactly what that means. And I think a better, uh, a more meaningful translation is desiring only what is given. Yeah, you don't, have, you don't even have any desire for anything which isn't given to you. Remember, this is the training for monastics. Yeah, now we're talking about the monastic path because someone has gone forth, they have become a monastic. Yeah. So you only, you have, oh, expectations, no desires apart from what is given. Uh, you have to just uh, content with whatever comes to you and that's good enough. Uh, it's a very nice way of uh, living life and then it makes you very content if you can live like that. Uh, you don't expect anything and very often you don't expect anything things come anyway. Yeah, that's kind of the weird thing uh, when you are in monastic as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, and uh, then we have the last one here which is uh, uh, not stealing, you abide in purity. Uh, and uh, again, this is one thing I have never really quite found why stealing is singled out in this way for abiding in purity. Elsewhere in the suttas, uh, you find that uh, morality in general is about abiding in purity. Uh, but here, stealing is singled out. Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe stealing makes you feel particularly impure. I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you, well, some of these things they have to kind of be, uh, I suppose, uh, reflected upon, and I haven't really found any solution for what that exactly what that means. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's worth uh, noticing, yeah, that stealing might actually make you feel particularly impure, and of course that's going to impede your practice as well. Then. So that is about not stealing. Yeah. Uh, next one, abandoning in celibacy. Yeah. Uh, this, this is wrong, yeah, this, this is uh, abandoning sexual conduct or se abandoning sexual activity is really the appropriate one here. Uh, uh, abandoning sexual activity, you observe you uh, observe sexual inactivity, living apart, uh, abstaining from the vulgar. Vulgar is wrong translation, it means common or ordinary, the ordinary practice of sexual intercourse. Uh, uh, so here, it, again, because we are dealing with the monastic life, you are actually dealing with abstaining from all sexual activity. Uh, uh, of course, for, uh, in, for lay life, usually this refers to Kame uh, 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 so which is the, uh, 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 the, the, the sexual uh, kind of bad practices. Uh, yeah? uh, but here, because of monastic life, it, it includes all sexual activity. So this is similar to what you do on a retreat when you take the eight precepts, uh, same kind of thing. Yeah? The last part here is the vulgar, it says here. And this is kind of the danger of translations. Yeah? The Buddhism doesn't really have anything against sexuality. And it's not an anti-sexual religion. Uh, it's not something you have to feel kind of bad about or you feel shameful about or anything like that. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, the reason that we give up sexuality in Buddhism is not because it's we should feel it's kind of shameful and anything. The reason we give up is because we want to go to get something higher. That's the reason. That's the only reason. Nothing else. So, uh, uh, and so this. That's why you know when you have words like vulgar, they give a very wrong meaning of what is going on. The Pali word again is gumbo, and gumbo means literally relating to the village. So it's what ordinary people do. Yeah, people have not got not practicing a higher spiritual path or something like that. That is what it refers to. 
So it's already people already have enough guilt feelings and all kind of this stuff already. You don't need to kind of add that on the Buddhist path. So that's why these kind of translations are a bit unfortunate. Why do these translations even occur? And the reason why these translations occur is because you have sometimes you have people like Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. He, he does the translations, and he is he has a PhD in philosophy. So his idea of words are quite different from ordinary people's ideas of words. When Bhikkhu Bodhi writes something, you have to have Bhikkhu Bodhi's text there, and you have to have the Oxford English Dictionary over here, and then you can maybe read this what he's talking about. It's a little bit like that, PhD in philosophy. And for him, the word vulgar is the meaning vulgar had two centuries ago. Yeah? And the word vulgar used to mean ordinary. That's what it used to mean. Yeah, all the ordinary people is what it used to mean. But now it doesn't mean that anymore. No? So, but he's kind of stuck in this realm that belongs to the Victorian age. Yeah? <laughs> and this is kind of uh, interesting. So sometimes we have to be, you have to be a little bit circumspect when you read these translations. So. And this is my job, is to point that out as we go through this. So, so why is this important? This is one of the things that is very kind of... Uh, um, interesting and important on the Buddhist path, that the vast majority of people don't get this. Uh, yeah? They think that, yeah, I'm going to live ordinary life, I'm going to enjoy myself in all ways. Yeah? I'm going to have nice meditation and I'm going to enjoy all the sensual pleasures in the world. Uh, this is kind of ordinary, the way that people often think. Uh, and that is why they don't grasp why there is such a thing as monastic life. Uh, yeah? it, there's no point in, if you can just enjoy sensuality like, like anything. Uh, that monastic life is pretty pointless, isn't it? This kind of doesn't seem to be much rationale for it anymore. No? So why do we have these kind of precepts? Why do these things actually exist? And the reason is uh, that if you want to, if you enjoy the pleasures of the world a lot, uh, yeah, if that is where you get happiness, wherever you get happiness in life, that is where you're going to be attached. By its very nature, that's how things work. If you get happiness from something, you're going to be attached to that. Your family members, your friends, they give you happiness, so you are attached to them. Things that you enjoy in life, you are attached to that, because it gives you something positive. And because you are attached to things that are external to you, these are things that have to do with the five senses. The five senses are like external. Yeah? Because you are attached to that, when you try to become very peaceful, there comes a point when the mind refuses to let go. You can't let go anymore, you can't go any further inward. The, the level of peace reaches a plateau and you actually can't, can't go any further. Uh, that is precisely because of the attachment to sensuality. Uh. So there is a trade-off. Uh. The more uh, uh, attached you are to sensual pleasures in the world, uh, the less ability you will have to become peaceful in your meditation. The more you give up the sensualities of the world, uh, the deeper your meditation will go. This is why we have this, uh, why this is such an important part of the path. Uh. Once you think about it, actually it's pretty obvious, yeah, it's, it's fairly obvious, especially when you go into very deep meditation, when you come to the jhanas, to real samadhi, because at that point you have to give up the sensory world entirely. Yeah, when you go into jhana, it's as if you're becoming temporarily blind. You are giving up the very possibility of seeing it, yeah, it's as if you have to accept that from now on I might be blind, from now on until I, you know, until... Uh, at least until my next slide, maybe for eternity, yeah, you're giving up sight completely. To be able to give up sight completely, you know, as if it's never going to come back to you again, uh, the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you have no attachment to seeing it. But most of us have some attachment to seeing. Why? Well, because it give, you know, seeing with regard to us, there's some, there's some happiness to be had through seeing. Yeah? You walk around the beautiful day outside, you look around, wow, it's so nice, yeah? seeing is so wonderful. Uh, uh, but actually, uh, when it comes down to it, there are things that are far more wonderful than the ability to see. And this is what we're trying to uncover on this path. Uh, so this is why we have these things, and this is why this is a import very important part of monastic life, but also of lay life as well. This is why we have these rules when you go on retreat, etc., to turn the mind in a different direction, uh, towards something more profound, even more happy, even preferable, to the ordinary happinesses of life. Yeah. So that is what that is about. And just to make it very clear, and also one of the things to remember as well is that uh, sensuality, if there's anything that binds you to samsaric existence, uh, it's sensuality. 
Sexuality is always very tied up with craving, always moving you forward, moving you on to something else, tying you down to samsaric existence. If you want to release yourself from the idea of rebirth, sensuality is one of the first things that you have to abandon. It's actually the main thing. Once you get rid of that, the rest is actually fairly easy. The hard, the really hard thing in life to get, get go of completely is our attachment to the five senses and giving that up fully. So a lot of the uh, uh, profound spiritual practice happens in that area, understanding the limitations of these things. So that is uh, the right action, as it is explained in the gradual training. So Sama Kamata. Yeah, and now we come to Sama Vajra. Now, I don't know if you have noticed this, but in the Eightfold Path, Sama Vajra comes before Sama Kamata. And here it is the other way around. Why is that? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know. I have no idea what that is. It's, <laughs> it's kind of strange. I, I've always wondered. I think maybe the reason is that there, there isn't really any sequence. That whether you have Sama Vajra, right speech first, or right action first, is kind of irrelevant. Uh, there are just two aspects of morality. And it doesn't really matter. And maybe the Buddha is trying to show that by kind of sometimes putting it one way, other so times another way. Uh, I don't know, but it's consistently like that. Uh, yeah, and I think it's like that wherever you go, whether you go to the uh, scriptures translated into Chinese or Tibetan or whatever, this kind of difference is found everywhere as far as I, I'm aware of it. So uh, I think what it means is that it doesn't really matter so much uh, when you, uh, whether one, there isn't really any important sequence to these things. Uh. Anyway, so. This is right speech for you. Abandoning false speech, they abstain from false speech. They speak the truth, adhere to truth that is trustworthy and reliable. Uh, someone who is no deceiver of the world. So this is the abandoning lying, yeah? And uh, again, just as with the previous factors, there is a positive and negative side to this. The negative side is to abandon lying, yeah, but the positive side is to be trustworthy and reliable. Yeah, it's not just that you don't lie, yeah, but you try to speak words that actually are really reliable and trustworthy. People feel that they can't. But when you say something, yeah, your word is your bond. You know, your word, you are really telling the truth uh, in, 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 a, in a very reliable way. Yeah. So again, there is this positive and negative side to lying. Yeah. Be careful about this because it's very often people become like little lawyers, uh, Buddhist lawyers, uh, yeah, and they kind of try to find out, I don't want to tell the truth, but I also don't want to break the precepts. So how can I kind of get away without telling the truth, but also not breaking the precept? What are the ex I want to know the exact boundary here. Uh, yeah, but that is, remember, this is actually missing the point. Uh, the point is not to be a lawyer to decide exactly where the boundary is, so you can kind of get away with semi lying without actually lying. That is not the point. The point is to be as trustworthy and reliable as possible. That is why you maximize your good karma and your progress on the path. But, yeah? So keep that in mind. It is not about the, the idea, this is the problem with a rules-based ethic. If you have a rules-based ethic, they become very square. Yeah? This is the limit, beyond that you're okay, but inside of like law, yeah, taxation law. How can I get away with paying as little tax as possible? Okay, in that case it's fine because you know this is what everyone does. We don't want to pay more taxes than we have to, so that's fair enough. But in ethics, when it comes to moral conduct, it's a very different situation that uh, because ethics don't work like that. Ethics are grey, they kind of it, it tapers off, yeah, and, and there aren't any clear boundaries like that. Uh, so instead of becoming little lawyers and trying to find out exactly where the cutoff points are, uh, we try to be as honest and reliable, upright as we possibly can. And then you are maximizing the right speech, uh, maximizing the right way of, of, uh, uh, of, you know, of avoiding lying and telling the truth in these things. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, a very uh, important point. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it also means that sometimes, you know, you can tell the truth in a harsh way. This is not about telling the truth for truth's sake. I'm going to tell you really give it to them by telling them the truth, yeah? If you think like, if you think like that, of course, it is bad again, because you're actually using truth as a way of not having compassion or being harsh with people. That, of course, isn't the point either. The point is to be compassionate. You tell the truth when, you know, if 
you know, if you are in a court case and it's something you've done something embarrassing or whatever, you don't kind of hold back with the truth because it's going to embarrass you. But on the other hand, if somebody else is in a difficult situation and uh, you know you know the truth is going to hurt them right there, and then you are a bit more circumspect how you speak. Uh, you don't kind of blurt out the truth just because you think that you're going to keep the first precept that way. It's about being compassionate with these things, being reasonable, doing it at the right time in the right place. Uh, then you are using truth in the right way. So remember this, remember to always go back to this very basic thing that what is moral and what is immoral, this is not rule-based, it is based on your motivation. Where are you coming from? What is driving your activity? Are you coming from compassion and kindness? Or are you driven by greed and anger and these negative states of mind? That is what is important. Know your motivation, then you know whether you're doing the right thing or not. Sometimes, uh, you know, if you think that it is not compassionate to uh, to tell the truth, then uh, you don't necessarily have to lie. You can say it's not the right time to talk about that. Let's talk about it later. Yeah, I'd rather not answer that question or whatever. You can always get out of these things in a, in a way which is wholesome without having to lie. Uh, in extreme example cases, it might even be acceptable to lie. Uh, and the classic example is the one that I, again, uh, one Adam Ram told me about. He told me about the. Uh, this is, I think it was in Perth, and there was a, uh, a, a couple, uh, and, a, and a husband, he was in hospital, he was going to have a bypass operation. And bypass operations are, uh, you know, occasionally they go wrong, occasionally the patient dies on the operating table, and about 2 or 3 percent or something else, it's a very small percentage. The vast majority of people go through no problem, but occasionally these things don't work out. Uh, and he was in this room, and he had a friend in the room. Yes, there was two men, both had going to have bypass operation. And then one day, his friend gets wheeled away into the operation table. Yeah, gets operated, and doesn't come back again. So he gets a bit concerned. Yeah, what, what happened to my friend? You know, he, he didn't come back. What's going on? So he, his wife comes to visit him, and his wife knows what has happened. And then he asks his wife, "What happened to my, you know, my roommate over here?" What, 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 well, why doesn't he come back? And his wife knew that he was one of those one percent or whatever didn't make it. He died on the operating table. Right? But she realized that if she tells her husband that you know he died and he is kind of going to be wheeled in the next in the next day or two, right? he's going to become pretty anxious about it. Yeah, it's natural to become anxious if you hear somebody else goes, oh, maybe the surgeon is not good. Maybe he's a drunkard or something like that. Yeah, but of course you have a problem. Yeah, not all surgeons have not all, Surgeons are, are like people, they have good days and bad days, unfortunately. That's just the reality of things. Uh, so his wife, instead of telling him the truth, she tells him, oh, he's okay, you know, he's just, uh, they have to put him somewhere else for whatever reason. Uh, so she lied in that case. Is that bad? Well, I think in that situation, you know, when you, if you, obviously she had some attachment to her husband, obviously, I mean, this is usually what, uh, especially if they had a good relationship. But, but generally speaking, I think in that situation, it is admissible to lie. You have to do quickly, because uh, basically you're coming from compassion, from understanding that in that case, not lying is actually being very harsh and being very unreasonable. So this tells you situations where, you, uh, where, where lying is not necessarily bad, and it can be the right thing to do. So remember, this is that the precepts, the five precepts when we have them, they are guidelines, they are not absolute rules, yeah? They are kind of things, okay, be careful if you're going to break them, but they're not absolute. The absolute morality in Buddhism, the final decider that, that kind of is the most important one for you to know whether you're moral or not, is where you're coming from. What is your motivation? That is what really matters. If you have any doubts, if you feel confused, if you feel that I don't really know what my motivation is, then stick to the five precepts because you are uncertain. If you have clarity about where you're coming from, about what you're doing, then you can go with your motivations instead. So the five precepts are actually very, very good guidelines. Please don't think that I'm kind of putting them down or anything like that. Far from it. Uh, they're very good guidelines and very useful in many ways, but they're not the final say in what is morality on the Buddhist path. Okay. Uh, so let us move on to the next one. You abandon malicious speech. Uh, Stay from malicious speech. Uh, you do not repeat elsewhere what you have heard here in order to divide those people from these. Uh, 
nor do you repeat to these people what you have heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus you are one who re reunite those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, who enjoys harmony, yeah? Samanga is the Pali word behind concord, concord harmony, rejoices in harmony, delights in harmony, a speaker of words that promote <coughs> harmony. Yeah? So this is the uh, avoidance of divisive speech, here, here called malicious speech, you can call it divisive speech. Um, and uh, again, you can see how there is two aspects to this. Uh, you avoid the dividing people, but, but you also actually try to bring people together. Yeah, you try to make people kind of understand each other and these things uh, instead of kind of dividing uh, people up. And the world is already so divided, we can do with a few more people who promote harmony in this world. And everyone seems to be kind of, uh, yeah, you know, our nation against that nation, our tribe against that tribe, our religion against that religion, and we just end up fighting with each other. Ultimately, that's what it leads to, yeah, if you kind of divide ourselves up too much. Uh, it's important to try to see other people as human beings, rather well, than seeing them as other, uh, different, uh, you know, they're not really humans. Uh, this is the first thing you see when you, you know, if you want to discriminate against somebody, the first thing you do is to dehumanize them. They're not really like us. We are different. They're not one of us, yeah? These are kind of outsiders, they're not fully human, they're a bit dodgy. Yeah? And uh, then you can, of course, it becomes very easy to kind of, to, uh, to justify killing someone or to have war against somebody if you dehumanize them, first of all. So uh, it's important that we kind of uh, uh, humanize each other, we see each other as human beings, and we kind of uh, relate to them in such a way. Then uh, we can ha have harmony together. Yeah? And, um, uh, it's very beautiful the way this is put. I really love these little sayings about right speech here. You know, the idea of promoting friendship, yeah? You enjoy harmony, you rejoice in harmony, yeah? And you speak words that promote harmony, yeah? Very often in this world we speak things about other people that promotes division rather than harmony, yeah? We may say bad things about somebody. And notice, the moment you say something bad about somebody else, what you're doing is you're creating a split between that person and the person you're talking about. Yeah? Because when you say something bad about somebody else, it always, you know, the other person always take, they don't take it on board 100%, but they take it on board a little bit. Yeah? It's impossible not to take it on board a little bit. It's just the way things are. So as soon as you say something bad about someone else, you're creating a split there. So, uh, uh, especially if you're coming from defilements, yeah, you're kind of fed up with this person that you're treating you badly, and now you have a bit of ill will towards them or whatever, it's very easy to s end up saying things that, that are negative about those other people. Uh, but uh, it is really important to avoid that. Uh, yes, we may be upset with a person or whatever, uh, but okay, so be it. Uh, still, you know, there is no need to create a necessary uh, uh, division here just because we are upset with someone. We know that upset will all, we will overcome that eventually. Uh, eventually things will turn around, we will change. And we also ultimately would like to be in harmony that with that person we are upset with down the road sometime, even if not straight away. Uh. So what does this mean? Does this mean that it, it is always wrong to say, kind of to point out people's flaws or people's problems? Is it always wrong to do that? Uh? And the answer is no. Sometimes you have to point out the bad qualities of other people. Yeah. Sometimes there is abuse going on, and this happens certainly in religious circles as well. That you know, I was saying bad things about uh, Osho the other day. Yeah. Yeah, remember that? I was saying bad things about Osho, yeah. and I feel that that is perfectly appropriate because uh, it's important to warn against abuse of in, in religious institutions like that. Yeah. We want to avoid that in Buddhism. And to avoid that in Buddhism, we have to face up to the fact that sometimes these abuses go on. And when they go on, we want to kind of sidestep that and go in a different direction. Or there may be other situations where somebody does something which is really inappropriate. Yeah? Should we talk about that? Well, sometimes we have to point it out. Not because you're coming from ill will or any kind of negative thing, but simply to protect people and to show people the right path, what is right and what is wrong. The Buddha in the suttas, uh, sometimes he talks about the views of other people. Uh, you know, there's some of these people in the suttas that have very, very bad views. Uh, 
one of the famous views of the suttas is that uh, you know whether you go on the southern bank of the river Ganges uh, and you slaughter all beings on the southern bank of the river Ganges, there's a lot of beings on the southern bank of the river Ganges, it's a long river, it goes for thousands of kilometers, if you slaughter all those beings uh, and you make it into one big pile of flesh, you have done nothing wrong yet. If you go on the northern bank of the river Ganges and you support, you are compassionate, you give out, you are generous uh, to all the beings there, you have done nothing good. Yeah, this is one of the views, and this is one of the views found in the uh, in the suttas, and they probably they would say it with a kind of religious seriousness. People say, yeah, okay, yeah, I guess you have a point, yeah, you, that's how, that sort of makes sense, the way you put it, yeah, because people are charismatic, they have an ability to say things which kind of draws people on board, and people will believe the most crazy stuff. This is one of the unfortunate things. And the Buddha says, well, this man is like a fish trapper. Yeah, he's like catching all of these people in this fish trap, and they perish in that fish trap because of that terrible view that he is uh, putting out there into the world. So the Buddha, and this was this uh, fellow called Makali Gosala. Uh, Makali Gosala was uh, or Makali Makali Gosala. He was one of those people who had one of these. He was a religious leader, but he had views that were just so uh, so detrimental to people's happiness and well-being. Yeah. And then if you say so, this is the wrong view, this person has got it wrong. Yeah. Sorry, please, you know, I don't recommend you to follow this person or whatever. That's okay. Yeah. Why? Because you want to help people. You don't want people to be trapped in something unwholesome and bad. Yeah. So the Buddha said, specifically says, and this is from the Anguttara Nikaya, he specifically says to uh, speak this phrase of someone worthy of this praise is actually good karma. It's a good thing to do now. Yeah. This is extraordinarily important because one of the things that you often hear in the Buddhist world, uh, you hear that, you know, oh, you know, don't say anything bad about this monk because he might be an Arahant, and if you say bad things about Arahant, it's going to be bad karma for you. Uh, very common view in the Buddhist world, especially in traditional Buddhist countries. Uh, yeah, you, you go to a place like Thailand, for example, people will say this all the time. Oh, I think this one might be Arahant. Uh, yes, he does some weird things on the side, but don't talk about that because he makes some bad karma. It's the other way around, yeah? It's exactly the other way around. If you don't talk about it, if you don't warn people that something dodgy is going on, that is why you're making bad karma, because you should point out the dangers wherever they are dangerous. So uh, remember not to be too afraid in this way. This is a misunderstanding of how uh, karma works and how uh, the Buddhist teachings are to be applied. Of course, if someone really is a saint, and they, and they uh, have done a small little thing which might not be quite right, then of course, okay, you take that into account. But even if you point out the small little thing that they have done, it's not going to be a bad karma, because after all, they did it. Yeah? It's not really an issue. Right? So you look at the larger picture, you know, but we're not afraid when something is wrong. We're not afraid to kind of call out the, the problem. Right? If nobody calls it out, uh, well, we're all going to be stuck. We're all going to be kind of led up the garden path and kind of you know, not, not get anywhere in this practice. Uh, so these things are actually important. Uh, so praise those people who are worthy of praise. Dispraise those who are worthy of dispraise. Uh, but be intelligent about it. Be discerning about it. Don't come to quick conclusions. That is the danger. If you speak quickly and fast without really thinking about it, that is why you make the mistake. Yeah. But if you have considered the situation carefully, you are discerning about it, and then you speak these things at the right time and the right place, uh, then it is a good thing to do. Uh. So this is what, uh, what this is about. Uh. So this is all about divisive speech. Uh. Um, okay. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Next one is harsh speech. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, lovable as a go to the heart, are courteous, desired by the many, agreeable to the many. Yeah, yeah harsh speech, yeah, so gentle speech being the opposite here. Yeah. And I really, again, I really like this little paragraph here, this little sentence. It's just so, uh, I don't know, it's just so attractive, yeah? Uh, uh, pleasing to the ear. The, uh, I like this Pali word. I always point this out whenever I do this retreat because it's such a nice little word. Kanna sukha. Sukha means happiness. Kanna means ear. Ear happiness, yeah? Mm -hmm. Your ears become happy when they hear these things. Uh, it's not quite, quite nice. Uh, ear happiness. 
the lovable, they go to the heart. Yeah, where does that go to the heart? We know what that is. Where does that go to the heart? They're gentle, they kind of you, you are, you know, you feel you trust them, and they go inside it. Courteous, desired by the many, and agreeable uh, uh, to the many. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, about uh, speaking gently. And even if you have to tell someone off, and sometimes we have to tell people off a little bit, and say, please don't do that, it's not the right thing, or whatever. And you know, this happens also in monastic life. Uh, in the beginning, when people become monastics, there are a large number of rules. Uh, there are things you can do and things you can't do, and if you, you have to tell people sometimes, yeah? It doesn't mean we can't tell people, it just means we do it in the right way. Yeah? You do it ideally with a heart of loving kindness, you do it in a gentle way, and you do it, if you don't do it yourself, if you do it yourself, then it's not so good to tell other people off, because that's called hypocrisy in English, and it also is bad also, according to the suttas as well. Yeah? So uh, you do it in the right, in the right way, that, this is really what it means. Uh, so it's not about whether other people feel that you are being harsh. Sometimes you may seem to be harsh. Sometimes we discuss, Sometimes the Buddha may appear to be a bit harsh. But uh, uh, you know, it's uh, it is where they're coming from that really matters. Only you can really judge whether you're being harsh or not, or whether you're coming from the right place uh, in these situations. There's a strange suttas where the Buddha. You know, there's one sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Chattama Sutta where the monks are so noisy. Yeah, and the Buddha says, they're just like this fisherman hauling fish. This is what must have been one of the most noisy things in the time of the Buddha, because it's always mentioned when there's a massive noise. So fishermen hauling fish, they're probably shouting and screaming, oh, pull over there, you know, grow up, draw on the fish, the fish are escaping, quit, or whatever, I don't know what they're doing. But fishermen hauling fish, obviously very noisy. So they're fishermen. So then the Buddha said, okay, well, I'm not going to be with hang around the monks who are so noisy. I like my peace and quiet. Yeah? I like to go back to my cave or whatever it is, just to chill. And, and all these monks are just too noisy. So uh, he goes off. Yeah? And it, may, it seems maybe harsh, doesn't it? The Buddha just goes away from the monks. And the lay people then come to the Buddha and say, please teach the monks. It's that kind of Nice. The many people actually go to the Buddha and says, "Please have compassion on your monks. Yeah, they are just young. They're just learning. it. Please come back again." And they use the simile of the calf. The simile of the calf is like, a, uh, if you are a cow and you have a calf, if that calf doesn't get to see its see its mother, then it tends, often dies. Yeah, it's often like that in nature. If you, if you lose your mother, I think even for human babies, it's often the same thing. If you don't have a mother who cares for and looks after you, and after a while, kind of, you just die, you wither away. And, and uh, so they say, well, it's like the, the mother with the, the cow with the calf simile. Yeah, they need you. You're like the cow. These monks are like little calves. Uh, yeah, they need you. So then the world thinks, yeah, okay. And then he comes back again. Uh, but uh, so sometimes you, you do these things maybe as a lesson, yeah, or as a way of showing, making a point or something. But you do it in the right way, and this uh, is a kind of the issue, the point here. Okay. Um, last factor of right speech. You speak at the right time. Speak what is fact, speak what is good, speak of the Dhamma, speak, in other words, the teaching and the training. It has discipline. Again, I prefer training it. At the right time, we speak such words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. I forgot the beginning there. You abandon gossip. Gossip is not quite right. You abandon idle chatter. Is much better. You abandon idle chatter, and you abstain from idle chatter. Now, and you speak in this particular way. Now. So, um, uh, uh, this is the last one. Now. So, uh, again, this does not mean that you never, that you always speak about Dhamma, yeah? Every conversation, imagine what the pain in the backside you're going to be, yeah? If you always speak about Dhamma, yeah? Okay, five aggregates, yeah, Rupa Kanda. <laughs> people say, go away, you don't want to talk to you anymore. You're annoying, annoying Buddhist. You are kind of too holy. <laughs> so that is not what it means. We have to, you have to be friendly, yeah? We have to be friendly with each other. This is one of the nice things that you see in the students. Uh, the Buddha is friendly with people. You start off with a courteous and amiable talk at the beginning. Uh, yeah, how are you? You know, how how are you going? Uh, and that kind of puts you at ease when people are friendly towards you. It puts you at ease, and then when you are put at ease, then you can have a more serious discussion afterwards. Uh, 
if you start off with kind of talking seriously straight away, people kind of, oh, what's going on here? Uh, so you put people, but the Buddha is a master of, well, he always does that at the beginning of a conversation. Uh, then, so you gain a bit of trust, first of all, and then you can talk about the Dhamma as a consequence. Uh, so um, a little bit of a, a, a kind and friendly talk is necessary. Uh, but apart from that, you speak at the right time. Yeah, uh, this obviously is a very important thing to know the time for saying things. Uh, very often, instead of waiting for the right time, if we feel like we have something we need to get off our chest, we just say it then, because I need to say this, rather than asking ourselves whether the other person is ready or not. Uh, but usually, if we want to say something, we should always ask ourselves whether the other person is ready to hear it. Uh, only then should we really speak. Yeah. Otherwise, it's kind of selfish. Yeah, I need to get rid of this because it's my, you know, I, I need to need to say these things or whatever. So the right time is important. Uh, speaking what is fact, obviously, is important. Yeah, speaking of what is good or beneficial, in other words, whatever is uh, uh, is helpful for the other person, whatever kind of makes improves their life. Uh, speaking of the Dhamma Vinaya, which is the teaching and the training. At the right time you speak such so words that are worth recording. Yeah, this is Nidana Bhakti in Pali. Nidana means a treasure. So these are words that are to be treasured. Words that are kind of profound. This is one of the things that I often found when I read the suttas. I mean, just the words that we're reading now, to me, are really to be treasured. Because they are so, to me, they are so, they are succinct, but beautiful. They kind of get to the point, yeah, in a very kind of easy way to grasp. But they're also, they, you know what's going on straight away here. You know these things are true, but you need to hear them from the right person, the right authority like the Buddha, to really allow them to sink in. These are examples of words that are to be treasured. Yeah, and when you read the suttas, or read the Dhammapada, for example, read a verse here, a verse there, you find something very beautiful that you, you know, think, well, this is so true. You know it already, but you need the Buddha to kind of say it, for it to really sink in. Uh, yeah, like, what is, are some, some of these verses in the Dhammapada again? The, uh, one of the uh, very famous ones about hatred is never overcome through hatred in this world. Hatred is overcome through love. This is an eternal law. Uh, and we, when you read that, of course, we know this is true. If you hate someone else and then you kind of hate back, it's not going to resolve anything. It just creates more problems. If someone hates you, it's their problem. Okay, please, you know, if you want to hate me, well, there's nothing I can do about that. You know, it's your issue, but I'm not going to hate you back. Yeah, I can see that you are being conditioned this way. In fact, I feel a bit sorry for you that you hate me, because really I don't think there's all that much to be hated in me. You know, I can't really see that thing that you hate. So it's really, sorry, but it's probably your problem, right? yeah? You don't, you don't say that, because that makes it worse, but you, you think <laughs> that, yeah? <laughs> so, and this is uh, kind of, this is the right attitude. We know it's true. We just have to be able to do it. And that's the hard part. Yeah? So these are the words that are treasurable, to be treasured uh, in, in the Dhamma. And there is so much in there. You take them out, on the, bring them out on the day when you really need them. Uh, they are reasonable, and this uh, this is actually, I think, a fairly good translation of the word. Sampadana is the Pali word. It's a bit obscure exactly what they mean, what it means, but it means like reasonable, with reasons, backed up properly, not just kind of random stuff. Uh, moderate, uh, this Pali word is, uh, what is the Pali word for this one again? Uh, Pariyantavati. Pariyanta means ha having a limit or an end, yeah? You, in other words, you are kind of reasonably concise. You are reasonably, you not know, kind of just go on forever. Uh, and you kind of stop when it is the right time to stop. Uh, uh, moderate is slightly misleading here, because moderate can mean many other things in, in English. So beneficial is the last one. Uh, and uh, so this obviously is very important as well. Uh, you speak things, sometimes you can speak the truth uh, without it necessarily being beneficial. Uh, but it should be, what you say, it should always be beneficial at the right time, to the benefit of the other person. So this then is right speech. Yeah, four factors, and again, they come in a certain order. The most important one is to avoid lying, especially very serious uh, kinds of lying, where you are taken to court and you swear on the Dhammapada, I promise to tell the truth, and then you lie through your teeth afterwards. Yeah, that's kind of, kind of considered really bad. 
So this is the thing you want to uh, avoid. But uh, remember that uh, one of the great things about speed is often about finding, if you like, skillful ways uh, of thinking about these things. Uh, and the way that I try to do things in my own life, I must admit I don't always succeed because it's very hard to succeed with these things fully. <laughs> the way I try to do it is I try to think, well, actually, I have a possibility of giving people the gift every time I open my mouth. Uh, yeah? And if I do that consistently, uh, Always, I can't really break any of these rules. It, yeah, if you always give a gift to somebody else uh, by saying something kind, something that goes to the heart or whatever, uh, then you are really practicing right speech throughout. And you are making so much good karma that will then support you in your practice, uh, help you to deepen your meditation, and all of these kind of things uh, as a consequence of that. Uh. So uh, that is uh, the factor of uh, right speech. So now we have... Uh, Done. Uh, the first four factors on the Noble Eightfold Path we have looked at so far, uh, and I have uh, gone into them in a little bit of detail, not too much, uh, because I think it is important to get a good grasp of the entire Noble Eightfold Path. That is all for this morning, uh, and this afternoon we're going to start with how to look at the mind, how to deal with the mind, uh, and this uh, gets in many ways even more interesting as we go through that. Uh, that is all for now. There will be some more interviews at the quarter past ten. So we have a few minutes to uh, stretch our legs or whatever, and we'll see those people who want to come over at the interview uh, behind the reception over there.